Welcome back to the Dr. Joe Show. Thank you for tuning in, folks. We have uh, two very special guests with us. For the folks who've been following the channel since it started and saw the very first podcast, our first podcast was on coenzyme Q10, a family of molecules, uh, one particular one that humans need. And I'm passionate about this. And I'm passionate about this because uh, one of my mentors in my residency training program was the one who introduced me to it. And we are so privileged and thankful to not only have my mentor on with us today, but his father as well. They're both doctors. Um, so we have Dr. Jens Langshen, my mentor in uh, internal medicine residency. He's a hospitalist um, in Albuquerque. And his, his uh, father, who is internal medicine trained and a cardiologist, got over 40 years uh, clinical experience. And one of the world grandmasters is that's and that's just what I'm going to say on CoQ10. And Dan uh, is here as my co-host. So welcome, Doctors Langchen. Do you have any introduction you would like to give us? I'll go ahead, Jens. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction, Joe. It's great to see you again, man. I think I last saw you on the wards running around uh, like a chicken with your head cut off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, it's been a while. It's good to see you again, man. Um, you too. I, I guess I would just uh, say, in terms of my uh, my world, uh, so yeah, I'm out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, as you know, and I've I've actually mostly transitioned to being a teacher at the medical school. So I I still have about a quarter of my job as clinical, but I'm teaching students um, uh, sort of like uh, ba basic statistics clinical research, study design stuff. Um, I'm in charge of the heart and kidney and lung physiology block. Um, so I'm a, I'm a block, they call it a block chair, but basically I, I do like basic science teaching the first two years of medical school now. So um, cool. that's my job these days, which has been a, been a ton of fun. Um, still do a little, finishing up a few research projects, nothing um, really major, no big grant, grant funding kind of stuff, but um Anyway, that's kind of what I've been up to. Great. And 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 so the heavier teaching, do you find it more rewarding? Yeah, it's really fun. It's I, I was getting a little bit burned out of the hospital work. You know, it's just kind of a depressing place, especially during the pandemic. It really took kind of a dark turn, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's no. been fun. It, it, it scratches the creative itch for a little bit, you know, like you can kind of get get goofy with how you teach stuff. And um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Pops? <laughs> Pops? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sort of like a horse with blinders, you know. It, it's weird. But the, uh, you know, I, after internal medicine, I did my fellowship under my father, Per Langshan, who was a cardiologist. He was the seventh cardiologist in the state of Texas and fantastic clinician. Uh, and so I learned a lot. I practiced... He when he retired from Scott and White, we practiced together here at Tyler for seven years, and it was awesome. But uh, anyway, it was uh, it was around 1983, just by uh, you could call it serendipity or coincidence or fate, pick your word. But uh, it was through a patient that my father was introduced to Carl Folkers, who was the uh, organic chemist. Uh, at that time in Austin, doing CoQ10 basic uh, research. And my father, Pear, and Carl became very, very close friends. And that's that was the start of the first, uh, you know, human uh, trials in the United States. Uh, and so when I joined... Uh, you know, when I, when I got into, you know, Temple, Texas and joined, the, you know, started that fellowship. Uh, from that time onward, you know, I was involved in uh, clinical research with Q and it's it's very addicting. Uh, you know, it's we sometimes kid it that it was a Q virus. You <laughs> you catch it and you can't get rid of it. But at any rate, the, the family of people worldwide doing Q research was relatively small and just wonderful eccentric, scattered around the globe people. Uh, no big pharmaceutical interests at all, so it just didn't have that sort of uh, nastiness that goes with 
the drug industry. And so anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of very exciting, good, good stuff. Uh, when I came here to Tyler in 85, uh, continued doing clinical research and I've done it ever, ever since, you know, uh, and it's become, it, it became a cornerstone of my clinical practice. Uh, it was unthinkable over the past really 15, 20 years to not use supplemental Q in anyone with heart failure, mild, moderate, severe. And so anyway, so that's kind of some sums me up. But, uh, and along the way, you just, everything you learn is useful in medicine, you learn from your patients. You, you really do. Uh, medical education, formal education, is sort of like learning the alphabet, but the, the real learning is later. When you, when you actually uh, treat treat patients, and I ask a question. So, and uh, Dr. Joe, we'll link to the presentation underneath this video because I think it's a must watch for everyone. If if uh, if uh, Peter agrees, is that okay, Peter? Do you, do you want us to link uh, to it, or? Oh sure, fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was really good. You touched on it a little bit in that video. Uh, the reason why there was no pharmaceutical industry interest was because it can't be patented because when they tried, it lost oh. the effects. Even adding like a methane group or just something simple like a analog, I think you called it, uh, right. doesn't work. So it's not like they weren't interested in the results. It's that a, they couldn't patent it, right? Yeah, it was hilarious, actually. They probably spent a good 15 years studying different Q analogs. Wow, they're all toxic as hell. They, I mean, the comment from one of the main guys who did that sort of work was, yeah, after some wine and just sitting around and talking, he goes, "Well, the only thing I can say is they made really good rat poison." <laughs> <laughs> so that sums up the Q analog uh, efforts, and there was a lot of efforts, a lot of money was put into. Man, if we could only make this a drug, you know, it was a big bonanza. But uh, I think it says a lot for Q that it's too dang powerfully simple. It'd be like trying to change a water molecule, thinking you could get away with it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had a study. We're doing clinical trials, and I had one study just this year where, you know, we get a lot of Dr. Joe's patients actually referred, a lot of patients from the clinics. And it was osteoarthritis study, and they wouldn't allow CoQ10 as a condiment. So patients had to come off of it uh, in order to be in the study, which I found interesting. And at like 20% of trials have something similar in that nature of CoQ10. Luckily, our obesity studies don't care. Uh, we have some obesity um we have a type 2 diabetes obesity study. And then actually a cardiovascular disease study we just started for obesity where they're studying GLP-1s. They allow coenzyme Q10. So it's kind of hit or miss, but I do find it funny when they don't allow it uh, in a lot of these studies. Hmm. Well, do they also exclude eating organ meats? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Those fried chicken livers will do it. I think they know most people don't eat organ meats, so they're not too worried about that. Uh, <laughs> you, I, you know, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> That's okay. Uh, Joe, no, you remember when you were uh, a resident at UNM, I think we still were able to prescribe coenzyme Q for inpatients, for hospitalized patients. At least it was on the floor. Like, you could order it. Um, uh -huh. It wasn't necessarily the best brand. Like, I don't think it was the reduced form, ubiquinol, but um, you could order it for patients. And then maybe two years ago, they took it off kind of just like on a whim. I asked them about it and they were like, oh, yeah, we just we're doing some housekeeping. Notice there were some old useless supplements still in the formulary. So we did it. <laughs> yeah, they wow. did. The same thing. But for a while, I, I could actually prescribe Q for my patients in the hospital. No longer. But where do you guys think um, the CoQ10 industry is going now? Because 
people are saying I don't watch TV. I haven't had a television since 2004 and I'm not going to change that anytime soon. But patients of mine are telling me they're seeing commercials for CoQ10. And what do you think is going on there? I, I mean, I, it's it's fascinating that something that can't be patented, we're seeing commercials for it, right? Well, what's happened, I, I we don't watch TV either, either so I, I don't, I've not seen any of these commercials, but uh, what happened with uh, Supplemental Q, uh, w- way back it was really, really expensive. You had to extract it from beef heart mitochondria and it was prohibitively expensive to really use other than small amounts. But then the the Japanese who are experts in fermentation of darn or anything, uh, there's a strain of yeast that makes the same coenzyme Q10 that we do. You know, most yeast are shorter chain. But anyway, so they ferment this yeast. It makes a ton of Q and then they extract it and it crystallizes out. So <clears throat> there were three companies in Japan that made all of the world's Q for a long time. And it was real simple, you know, cause it was all, it was all reliable, it was all good. <clears throat> then, and this, this scenario has, re- has happened in other supplements. It's happened with vitamin C even. Uh, the, the Chinese are remarkably clever people. And what they decided to do is get into the Q world. And they started making massive amounts of Q in a number of different facilities in China and it's pooled. So you can't, you know, you can't really assess them too well. Certainly not individually, but at any rate, they, they're, they're state supported. So they undersell everybody. And two of those three Japanese companies are out of business as far as who knows. And then there's only one remaining one. And uh, they're reliable. They have a plant in Pasadena to south of, of Houston. And, at any rate, what I think is happening, because this has happened before, uh, once they have a lock on the market, then the price goes way up. Uh, and they're probably, you can make a profit on Q, especially if you make a, you know, you can make it pretty cheaply, depends on what method you use. So, uh, and if you think of the market for it, I mean, it's almost everybody, you know, so... Yeah, even it doesn't have it doesn't have to be pharmaceutical for them to make money on it, and especially if they have a monopoly on it. So, I think that's what why you're seeing ads. I don't know, but it's my my guess. But it's, well, isn't it just a, like a branding game at that point? I mean, it's just like a supplement at this point, and it's just a branding. Like the perception of which brand is better matters more than. The actual quality, as far as sales is concerned, uh, I just, I, I wonder why, because there are like these liquid, the other day I went to my Costco and they had this vendor there and they were selling this liquid OQ10. I think I showed you, Dr. Joe, the picture. So they're having yeah. different formulations of it and they're trying different things. They obviously know it's catching on, it's getting more popular. Uh, so there are players like big players in there, but at the end of the day, it's commoditized. And I think there's like a price pressure on competition. Yeah, we should just make it clear, maybe right off the bat, uh, neither of us nor anybody in our family, uh, has any financial interest in any Q company or anything. Um, and that's sort of been nice, you know, you really have complete freedom uh the but so yeah i it, it, it's a it's a bit of a problem because the chinese queue unfortunately uh is uh inconsistent and we didn't see either good queue levels or clinical effects with it and it never says made in china you know so <laughs> but we could tell you know we could take a sample of any you know, with our lab, we could measure Q in anything, you know, organs or what have you. Uh, and so you could take a sample of a caps of the contents of a capsule and analyze it. And the Chinese stuff was trash. I, you know, there's, we call them ghost peaks. There's a lot of compounds in big amounts that we didn't know what they were. 
And then it took us, since we don't know what they are, it takes you a week to clean your columns because you just have to guess on the solvents. But any rate, the, um, so we sort of gravitated to just using only the one Japanese company, uh, Kanaka. And they've, they've been reliable. You know, they just make the bulk products and then the, a whole bunch of people can put it in wherever they want. Uh, the Q that they make is happened to be the reduced form of Q. They call it ubiquinol. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a little better absorbed than ubiquinol. They both work, but the um, because it's at least for now in North America, uh, the Chinese there, there is some litigation about it, some fights between the Japanese and Chinese, but uh, they can't sell their ubiquinol here in the states. I, th but yeah, I could be wrong. Who knows? Things so things. you're saying China cannot. China lost this lawsuit. Yeah, and uh, they can't because they can make you look okay. uh, And uh, so at the moment, the Japanese have the ubiquinol market here. Maybe that's what but, still. But you know that makes me think of the series on Netflix called Rotten. Have you guys watched it? No. So the I I want to say the first or second. It might have been the first episode. It was all about honey and about how china has figured out ways to beat our biochemical tests and make their rice syrup look like honey biochemically and what they do is they send their ri their rice syrup to all their neighboring countries and then those neighboring countries export honey and that gets sent and then th that is and a lot of that comes to the united states so even though we think we're getting indonesian honey it's actually chinese rice syrup so I I'm glad to hear that the Chinese stuff is banned, but I'm but I'm 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 still wary that China might be doing the same thing with CoQ10 as they did with honey. Sure, I wouldn't doubt it either, and I don't know. So brands, yeah. so so you said Konica, and 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 again, folks, none of us have any financial disclosures. I'm going to say it again. Nobody here, like we don't have stock in any of this stuff. You said Konica. Konica is the Japanese manufacturing company. Yes, K A N E K A, right? Uh, they're they, they've they've been good and reliable. You know, of course that can change, but when uh, you know we didn't uh, trust anything, so we you know we could follow Q different Q products real accurately, both by clinical effect on heart muscle function and by blood levels. Uh, so it, you know, you, and actually now there's commercial labs like Quest, for instance, has a good CoQ10 assay. So, you know, that's kind of the bottom line. So let's say you have somebody in heart failure and they're taking brand X and you check their, after they've been on it for a few weeks, you check their blood and it, let's say it's therapeutic, it's over 2.5 micrograms per milliliter. Well, that's good, you know, uh, it's kind of a an easy way to do it without a, like a research lab. Or something. To, to clarify one point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dad, but the so the Chinese companies have been banned legally from selling ubiquinol, right. the reduced form, in the United States. Uh, Not okay. ubiquinol. So most types of Q that you find are ubiquinone. The oxidized form that's the most common that's liquid. what's in that liquid cube yeah so that's the, there's lots of chinese produced manufactured q in the states it's just not ubiquinol which i think is why uh you're recommending the ubiquinol yeah because we know that, you know we, we have better sort of uh quality control um experience and data because because you can be pretty certain that it came from the konica um manufacturer if it's ubiquinol does that make sense yes absolutely so i mean so so there's two reasons now so it's better absorbed and there's the more or less stamp of quality control so so there's two big reasons now um yeah wow um so 
I, I, I think delving into how to research that we can hash that out, you know, off, off, off the air. I, I don't think that's a, that's a big deal. My, like I didn't, I didn't know the name of the company. So, so for folks who want to do research, Kanaka, it's uh, based in Japan. Find out where their ubiquinol comes from. Okay. Well, find out where it's going guys. Okay. So um, some other questions I wrote down. Uh, are statins good for anything? <laughs> uh, you're asking the wrong doctors here, the, Dr. Joe. Yeah, <laughs> We're what? famous statin haters. <laughs> you can answer with one word, no. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's tough. Like in a clinical practice, somebody has an MI, somebody has a massive, you know, MCA stroke, whatever. And, and we put them on statins. The studies show the benefit. I, I like, how do we, how do we make sense of that? I mean, is there some benefit in the acute phase you think? No, no, nothing. Okay. So back to, um, and, 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 and Dan, I'm not sure if you had a chance to upload our last podcast, Dan, uh, did you upload it? It's uploading as we speak. It's, it's a uploading. File. Yeah. 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 Scientism. Yes. Yeah, scientism. So that was the topic of our podcast that we did actually a couple nights ago. Um, you know, one of, one of the slides in uh, your presentation, Dr. Langshan, uh, was the exclusion of CHF patients. I found that fascinating. So they excluded the CHF patients in the studies on statins. Have there been any changes to that trend or is that still a trend as far as you can see that they're excluding that from well, statins? Well, there's some big trials where they purposely looked, they, they recruited heart failure patients put them on uh, statins with the uh, with the goal of trying to show some benefit in heart failure. One was a corona trial, the other was GCHF, and they both were flops. Uh, but it's a, th there's a group called the, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics with a C, it's T-H-I-N-C-S, dot uh, org, I guess. Uh, I, my wife and I were sort of among the first few founding members of that group, and there's an absolute wealth of information. These guys are on total on top of their game, and as far as the literature on uh, statins, then it's massive. You know, but if you look at it carefully, and these it has been looked at carefully, uh, you know, you just there is no there is no indication to use those drugs. Uh, there's it's not possible to show. I mean, other than fraud, you know, but if you honestly look at these studies carefully and do the numbers yourself, it's uh, they're they're nothing but harmful. It, it's one of the uh, malignant medical myths, if you want to use Joel Kaufman's term. Uh, I, I find it I find it fascinating that the CDC now uses the phrase age adjusted rates of things. So they don't have totals anymore. They say age adjusted. And if anybody knows what the word adjustment means, like think of an insurance adjuster after a cataclysm. OK, they're adjusting how much money you're going to get because they don't want to give you money. So. If you're adjusting the death rate, you're making it look smaller. That's it. So the CDC said last year the CVD death rate per 100,000 was like just over 200. But when I crunched the numbers, it's more like 260 something, which is the same as it was in the mid 90s. And it goes up and down. So if you look at the cardio, the total cardiovascular death rate of our country, it is no better than it was 30 years ago. And, and this is, um, I, I mean, this is, this is reflective of, uh, I think the fraud that we're, that we're being told to practice and, yeah, and the lack of, and like the lack of regulation on the food industry, you know, I'm all for a freedom. I'm all for, you know, something between center, right constitutionalism and libertarianism somewhere in there. You know, I think most people who are reasonable are somewhere around there. 
And, but you know, the food industry, if, if, if something is actually poisoning the populace and, and we're not doing something about it, you know, that's, that's kind of the big question. What do we do and how do we do it? Mexico's obesity rates are exceeding the United States. Um, you know, uh, fast food isn't going away anytime soon. Omega six fatty acids. Uh, Wait till are, uh, Westernization starts getting into Africa. We're already seeing signs of increased obesity in Africa, where Westernization is headed, and fast food is becoming prevalent now. So it's becoming a global issue. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned the Quest assay for CoQ10. I mean, I'm going to see if we have that available. Now, have you guys heard of the cardio IQ test as well? Oh, Joseph, you, it sounds vaguely familiar. So, they look, so you look at oxidized LDL, you look at um, myeloperoxidase, you look at LPPLA2, and then there's like the LDL fractionation. And we started doing that in our clinic. And um, I find it to be useful and useless, you know, about equal in those two groups because they're the patients coming in to just want to check boxes and get a drug and stop thinking about their diet. And then there's the really conscientious ones who come in and they want to know more. Do you have, do you, do you have any gestalt about, you know, how to approach patients and how to choose them for these specialized tests? Oh, not really. You know, my, my stance on the whole measure and cholesterol levels was if it's been measured once in your life, that's enough. Uh, you, you would pick up the homozygous, you know, the, the, the cholesterols of a thousand or something like that, you know, the, the genetic, uh, rare genetic. Some little hypercholesterol. Yeah. So I never got into it. Yeah. I, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a control level that's, say, you know, 280 or 300, everything about your health is going to be better. You know, there's no question. Uh, and it's it's just disturbing as I'll get out that that's been vilified so much that, you know, it takes a while to un, undo a lot of that propaganda with patients. You know, they, most of them, and I this is an optimistic observation of mine, they have a healthy skepticism for the whole medical empire. Uh, and it's gone downhill, I think. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time when medical education went out of its way to not accept any funding from uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Well, now it's 100% funded by them. So, yeah, there was a time when I think I think, no doubt, medicine was better, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, but now it's just, uh, it's a mess. You know, it's a real mess. Yeah, the, the whole cholesterol thing, you could think of it, so it was, it, it, one, one term for it would be a, a surrogate biomarker, right? So uh, a biomarker meaning a lab test that, you know, that you can measure and you're using it as a surrogate for some sort of a theoretical uh, risk of having a heart attack, right? Or having a stroke. And the question is, is it causal, right? So the assumption, I think by mainstream Western medicine is yes, absolutely. This is proven to be a causal toxic substance in our blood, especially the LDL form, right? Um, but there's, uh, Dan, as someone who teaches uh, clinical research and has written a book about it, you could probably comment even more on this, but there's all these other, you know, you have to think about all the, what we call the confounders, right? So like, what are all the other things that, what are the things that can e increase your cholesterol that could in turn also independently increase your risk of heart disease, right? So cholesterol is a precursor to stress hormones. So if you are stressed, um, I'm curious, uh, yeah, can I started. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's, uh, it's I tough. might try, but if, if you're stressed, if the primary problem is stress, that would in turn increase your cholesterol. 
right? Um, and it could also independently increase your risk of heart attacks, right? Via increasing, um, you know, inflammatory uh, cascades, right? Like making you putting your body in more of a state of inflammation. So it could make it look like it was the cholesterol that caused the problem when in fact um, it was the stress. So you could use that same example for, um, I'm not sure how to draw on, on this stuff. I'm not seeing anything but, on the whiteboard. Are you guys writing stuff? No, I was trying to figure it out while I was talking, but I might just give up. Oh, um, oh. I used to be able to do this. Notes? No. Anyways, you get the idea, right? So um, let me close this whiteboard nonsense. Okay. If you uh, if you have obesity, that will increase, increase your cholesterol. You also have that obesity itself causes an increase in coronary disease, right? Mm -hmm. um, both from the adipose tissue being an inflammatory organ, barrow trauma from higher high blood pressure, like all, a lot of there's all these things that will both increase cholesterol and all on their own, not via the cholesterol mechanism, but all on their own increase um, atherosclerotic plaque, for example, right, which predisposes you to heart attacks. So it could be <clears throat> that's that um, well, if there is any benefit of statins, which we're not convinced of, but if there is, it could be that it's happening by a mechanism completely unrelated to cholesterol reduction. So this turns out that the, the statins, the issue with statins, by the way, I don't know if we've said this, one of the major issues is that they block your body's ability to synthesize coenzyme Q10, right? So, yes, you know, you uh, have like a, an issue storing energy in your body so that the organs that need energy the most, such as your brain and your heart, um, yeah. tend to start at the time, right? So um, um, HMG coa, re coa re reductase, if I'm not mistaken, right? It blocks yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was going to try to put oh. on the whiteboard to yeah. be able to get that to work. But yeah, so there's an ancient biosynthetic pathway that um, is used in living organisms all over. I don't know who's, Almost all. Plants and animals. Plants and animals alike are using this biosynthetic pathway. Statins block it at an earlier uh, part of the pathway, such that, you know, this, uh, it's called the mevalonate pathway. So is these, you know, one compound turns into another and then it branches out and makes a whole bunch of different things, right? So if you imagine blocking the pathway here, you are dropping your cholesterol, which is thought to be good, right? Uh, maybe not. We need cholesterol for coding your neurons in your brain. Like we need cholesterol for all kinds of things, but yep. it blocks cholesterol, also blocks coenzyme Q, and it blocks other things too, right? So there's the selenoproteins, selenoproteins dolichols, right? There's all these sort of that may have inflammatory aspects. So one theory is that if statins do have some amount of benefit, maybe they're actually not working via. Yeah, here we go. Very good. Yes. Maybe they're. Maybe there's an anti-inflammatory effect that's happening from the statin in acute phases, such that the plaque gets stabilized. Um, but that then, if that's the case, then why are we? Why do we have this whole, you know, diseaseification of cholesterol? Right? Like, why do we need to track these numbers? And you know, there, a, a lot of the people that teach and work at my hospital are, you know, basically saying there isn't a too low cholesterol. Like cholesterol of zero would be great, right? <laughs> Um, wow. <laughs> which is just crazy. Um, well, if your goal yeah, was be yeah, um, <laughs> Jesus. So, so I think even if you took a, uh, even if you gave the benefit of the doubt that the clinical, that the industry funded clinical research on the statins is honest, um, even if you believe that, I think you it, you would have to look at the data fairly and say the only real time that these studies are showing a clinical benefit in terms of saving lives is in what we call secondary prevention. So people that have already had lots of heart attacks and maybe in the acute phase, there's a plaque stabilization thing happening. All of the efforts to reduce death by putting people that are healthy other than this high cholesterol on statins have not really panned out. There's even a Cochrane review combining all these studies where they can't really show a mortality benefit. They can't show that they've saved any lives putting 
people without heart disease on statins, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's really kind of weak sauce evidence. And that's even if you give them the benefit of the doubt, which I don't think the pharmaceutical industry deserves any benefit of the doubt about their research at this point. You know, um, they just have too big of a financial interest in the... Um, um, like re and, and now they're repurposing drugs uh, that, they, that they still have a monopoly on. So repurposing statins to treat uh, COVID infections. And like you said, maybe maybe there's that very short term benefit but yeah but don't take it for don't take it for a year i mean like do it do an honest to god study on it okay just like we take uh certain things that we can't talk about like certain uh certain things that were discovered in 1954 that treat uh parasite infections right <laughs> you know for a short term uh that that treats covid so um why can't we see studies on that uh, but, and it's all because there's a repurposing of all drugs. It's like ritonavir. Let's, let's, let's say it's a good idea to, to inhibit a whole subset of P450 enzymes in the interest of treating a, a mild viral infection that has gone through so much mutation that it's like a nothing burger. So, so yeah, it, it, it is all scientism. Uh, and so the question is what percentage of, <laughs> Nobody can answer this. What percentage of mm, guidelines that come out now are actually honest? Probably none. The, so the ACP3, um, which is the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, ATP3. Is that the cholesterol? Um, Y'all could Google this. There's a national uh, oh, the guy. group. I believe it's ATP3. The oh, cholesterol God. guideline. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Um, You're right. The ATP3 guidelines, yeah. uh, some absurd number of the uh, you know, experts writing these guidelines work for the pharmaceutical industry. You know, it's yeah, yeah, like it's it's a joke. You know, like why why are the people that directly stand to financially benefit from selling these drugs the ones that are in charge of you know objectively looking at the evidence right to figure out what the ideal cholesterol and then sure enough every few years the cutoff for an abnormally high cholesterol keeps look, going down right such that if you think about all humans being on a bell curve right a gaussian a gaussian bell and you and you think about well where do you put the cutoff for how high the what's too high the cholesterol they've moved it into the middle of the bell curve you know what i mean <laughs> such that like normal human physiology counts as a disease state now. They're, they're, they've done the same thing with hypertension. You know, if the hypertension guidelines are moving. They started to move the, you know what I mean? It's just such that everybody has a disease so that everybody needs a drug, right? It's And and, it seems, and we're lowering, it seems like the, and, and lowering of standards, right? Like the old A1C cutoff used to be 5.4. Now it's 5.6. So... I mean, what is the, is the, is the good A1C going to be, you know, 5.9 in 15 years? Oh yeah. 5.9 is normal. You know, is that going to be the new standard? I mean, um, I, I didn't want to forget about this. What do you guys think of Secubitril Valsartan? Cause what I remember, um, so when that medication came out, I, I don't want to say the brand name. Okay. Uh, for obvious reasons, <laughs> for what I'm about to say. Um, Jens, do you remember uh, Richard Hoffman at the VA? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I did research with him. Yeah, so really, like, he was he was, he was, was my mentor of outpatient, like, for the time that he was there. And I, I was really sad when he left. He was, he, he was awesome. And, he was, and he's an editor of the PSA article on Up to Date, and he does a lot of research on cancer and stuff. But I think he's at UIowa right now. But he, when, when that medication had just come out, I was, I was in residency and, and use, and people still had access to that original study and the supplement, right? So that study showed a power of 10,000 patients. Everybody remember that, right? Now, did anybody read the supplement and know how many patients were excluded from the study? 90,000 patients were excluded from the study. So what? When I see an exclusion like that on on a supposedly very effective heart failure medication, um, that that's a that's a that should be a big red flag that um, 
that the company has information that nobody else has and they know who to exclude. And um, I just think that's atrocious. And oh, I also I also have to ha have an observation with that medication. And, I, and I'm going to shut up af after that. African-Americans seem to as uh, I see a trend when African-Americans get put on that heart failure medication, say Cubitril Valsartan. Uh, they end up with severe thirst and they go into CHF exacerbations more than non-African-American patients. I don't know if you guys have seen that. I'm going to shut up. I don't know if I have seen that, but I've, I've, uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of a minimalist with uh, pharmaceuticals. You know, the when you when you fundamentally improve heart muscle function, there's a secondary. It's not a direct effect, but there's a secondary lowering of blood pressure. Uh, and so the need for a lot of these pharmaceuticals uh, decreases to the point where. Uh, at least in my many years of practice, I didn't have a lot of people on uh, sort of answers, you know, standard pharmaceuticals, just a little bit. I mean, some like a diuretic or, you know, some beta blockers. But the uh, I did want to point out one thing I think is important. You know, we, we said there's uh, that we know there's no benefit to, <clears throat> you know, lowering cholesterol with uh, cholesterol lowering drug there's there's one big exception to that there's a psychic benefit to it if you think of it when you see a new patient they have many times it's decades of brainwashing and they've learned to fear th this cholesterol in their blood they've they've learned that when they hear the term bad cholesterol they actually believe it they believe that there's some moral issue with <clears throat> low density lipoproteins versus high density. But anyway, so when when they come into a clinic and they have their blood drawn and oh my gosh, you know, everything looks good except the cholesterol has several stars or highlights and ah, it's, the nurses are, you know, they're you know, they, you've got to get into the doctor right away. This is a super important thing. You could have a stroke or heart attack. There's a great deal of fear uh, centering around a blood test. And so when you give a drug and then you, they come back in a month or two and recheck their blood work and, you know, the cholesterol is 100 points less or whatever, you know, much lower. Everybody's happy. There's a great uh, sort of... You know, there's, there's big smiles, everybody's face in the clinic, and the doctor gives you a big pat on the back, and boy, you're going to do great now. It, it, you know, so there's a, I wouldn't underestimate the power of that, That's a, that that happens. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of like demoralization. Uh, you know, that, uh, that, 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 that way that, a society goes undergoes a insurgent psyop by an invading force. So you know you demoralize the population, then you cause a crisis. And in and in the case of war, it's either an invasion or civil war, and then there's normal, and then there's norm, there's normalization. So um, I think I think in this case it's it's an invasion because it's it's an improperly used substance. Uh, that everybody thinks is good and it's being normalized. Do you think that's a, or do you think that's a bit of a stretch or do you think that's a fair comparison? No, I don't think it's a stretch. The, the one uh, bright light in things, uh, there's a real healthy and real positive increase in non-compliance. <laughs> you know, that data is pretty awesome. You know, it, and this is a, it's probably worse than the study I'm thinking about, but the it's like after a year, at least half of people are no longer taking their prescription uh, cholesterol lowering drug, and then by two years, it's you know maybe twenty percent are still taking it, and so that that you know there's room for hope there, you know people uh, yeah 
that part is true. Yeah, and like anecdotally, I see it. My mother-in-law was prescribed uh, statins, and she she treats the doctor as God. So this is what they do in the in the Latino culture. They're, the doctor is like the priest. Like what he says, what she says is what is true. And her own body told her to stop taking the statin. She told me in Spanish, I don't need it. I'd rather not have these side effects than have this medication. And she even said, I'd rather just work on my diet than have to be on these things. So I think what you said, there is a lot of people in that camp that get prescribed something, get excited about a pill being a uh, cure-all. And then they realize there's no such thing as a biological free lunch and uh, <laughs> they got to pay for it somehow. So working on the diet's better in the long run. So there's this really impressive disconnect between the reality that you read about in um, research papers on statins, summaries of summaries of research papers. Like if you went to read the up-to-date article on statins, right, you, you would be blown away by how safe and efficacious these are, how many lives they save, and also just how rare the side effects are, right? And they get these numbers from clinical trials, right, from, from randomized clinical trials where... Dr. Joe mentioned this exclusion issue, right? Some of these early statin trials, which they still use to sort of market the drugs in terms of their benefits and their safety, they have a thing called compliance screening in a lot of these early trials where they would have the patients before they actually became officially part of the study, they would have them trial taking the statin to see if they had any side effects. And if they didn't tolerate the drug, they would be screened out. So they're basically effectively creating a designing a group of superhumans that are immune to the side effects of these toxic drugs, studying it on them, right? Yeah, they did all the time. And then and then applying that to the larger population, right? So that's why like everybody who takes a statin feels like shit, you know? Like they part pardon my French. Um everybody yeah. not everybody, but a huge number, way it doesn't it doesn't match, you know, like Right. I think anybody who actually practices and pays attention to their patients knows a lot of people have side effects from these drugs. It's not 1% or whatever these studies say. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know, 50 to 75% or so. Like a, a very large number of people, if they take these drugs long enough, start to have some fatigue or some muscle weakness, often proximal weakness, right? Dementia. Um, Dementia. Memory. memory. My okay. mother-in-law, the reason she stopped the statins, she started forgetting things. As soon as yeah. she stopped them, she remembered everything again. Like, she didn't like that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Who would, right? <laughs> uh, peripheral neuropathy. Like, the, the side effects in these drugs are through the roof, but we're being told that they don't exist. You know? So, you see, you have this, like, really... It's almost like hearing on... Like, you watch the the news and they're saying, Oh, the economy is better than it's ever been, you know? <laughs> and then you go to the grocery store and like a steak costs three times as much as it did last year. And yeah. you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> What's the... uh, anyway, they, they, do, they do cherry pick. They, they cherry pick a, a lot of the studies, even in the phase three. Um, what you're talking about is probably in the phase one healthy volunteer. They try to rule out like the high toxicity for the maximum tolerated dose and things like that. Uh, but I work on the phase two, phase three, and they do cherry pick a lot of patients. They cloak it under safety, under the guise of safety and ethics. Um, but they certainly don't use ethics as an excuse when something benefits them. So <laughs> as someone that works in this industry, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, but it is not in the phase three. And the phase three is usually like one to two years, one to three years of a study duration. But even that's not enough time to get like the true endpoints. You really need like 10 year studies. Right. Yeah, for sure. Now, do you think that oxidized LDL and VLDL, do you think monitoring those could show any promise if we just, if we focused on people's balance of omega-3 and omega-6 and excluding the bad omega-9s and all the new omegas that have been discovered. Do you think an emphasis on that could be fruitful? Uh, I I think I've always thought it would be really cool. I didn't have a, 
of the opportunity or whatever that to do it in any big numbers. But I thought the uh, checking the omega three six ratio in people's blood would be really cool. Uh, more cool than the oxidized uh, LDL. You know, we we did reduce an oxidized Q, you know, and that's kind of a marker for oxidative stress, you know. Uh, and anyway, and then I, I had an interest in this whole concept of, well, it's not the LDL, whether it's oxidized or not, that might be an issue. Uh, I never was real impressed with it, and I, but I have to say, I, I don't have a lot of experience or in that. But I guess the bigger picture here, Dr. Joe, I think that we've really taken a kind of reductionist approach as a society towards medicine, right? Like we're looking at these molecule, these molecule levels in the blood. We're trying to find drugs that specifically fix these numbers. You know what I mean? Um, but the whole thing, like it creates a kind of neurosis, a neurosis, you know, where you're instead of just kind of looking at the big picture, like maybe we should be eating food that like you know <laughs> grew somehow rather than was manufactured you know or maybe we should yep. like run around and <laughs> do stuff with you know you know what i mean like it, i think that you can easily be incredibly healthy without ever seeing a doctor or checking a blood test just by kind of making some basic changes to your lifestyle you know and um and we've sort of created this culture where everybody expects to go see the doctor and have a whole panel of labs done and fine-tune everything make you know your vitamin d is low give you some vitamin d or I, I honestly wish doctors did more of that but just the whole just to be a little i guess take devil's advocate of the whole thing you know like do we really need to be doing all this stuff you know what if we what if doctors became a little bit more uh what if we had you know individuals that patients could see that like help train them on like making some changes in their lifestyle, you know, like help them um, figure out how to, you know, cook <laughs> food that's healthy. I don't know. That would be cool. I mean, I've actually thought about that. I mean, what if, what if it was a concierge service where you go with a chaperone into somebody's house with a bunch of ingredients and you show them how to make like a healthy omelet or something something straightforward uh preparing something uh i yeah. think that would be that great would be more helpful than, like giving them a bunch of made-up diseases based on lab tests <laughs> you well, know yeah I mean? like well like, like IBS. What we do, right? <laughs> uh, like like my favorite made-up diseases is ibs and all the subtypes you know ir irritable bowel syndrome i mean what what the hell is that i mean it, it's basically because we've normalized eating eating, you know, artificial sweeteners and maltodextrin and a bunch of other food additives and people get irritated, leaky gut and they get variable amounts of diarrhea and cramps and constipation. And we just slap a name on it and make it an ICD-10 code and bill for it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, I, I think more of that needs to happen. I, I'm, I'm very thankful and privileged to be in the clinic that, that I'm in because uh, the type of clinic that Dr. Smith has set up, it's a private clinic and we have a weight loss program. We do body comps on people. We, uh, and, and we're all expected to go through the obesity medicine association training at least once so that we get like the pillars of treatment down. And that does include drugs, but they're not mandatory. And a lot of patients of mine lose weight w without the drugs because they are, because they're motivated because they have, because they figured out that like, I just need to learn to be hungry and I need to do the work and learning how to be hungry. Like that's, that's the one liner. That's, that's the one liner that, that people um, need, need to just start internalizing. I, I must learn to be hungry and be comfortable with that. What are your thoughts? You know, it, I got to tell you this, it reminds me of a saying that my father uh, told me a long, long time ago about Norwegians. He said, you know, they're never really happy unless they're simultaneously hungry and cold. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, I just <laughs> love it. <laughs> Autophagy and high testosterone. <laughs> Boom, right there. Yeah, yes. I, I see it. 
<laughs> but there's a, and I think with a lot of people, they're so addicted to refined carbohydrates. You get a really fast hunger response when that starts to crash. There's a, a week or two period where you can wash that out of your system and go to eating, you know, things that stick with you a lot better. You know, that's mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that's supposed to be bad for you, right? Like eggs or um, whatnot. Um, but I think you can, at least when I've made those changes, I'm hungry a lot less, like just because it sticks with me and I don't have that sort of, you know, glucose crash after eating a bunch of refined carbs that's just constantly putting you in this hunger cycle, you know? So I think, I think it's the, it, yeah, one thing I'll try to do with my patients is, encourage them if they can make the transition to eating different types of food they're going to be really hungry for a little while but then that will change yeah you know yeah. Not, like you, got you don't have to be hungry. you don't have to like learn to like being hungry forever you just have to do it <laughs> long enough to get unaddicted to uh, you know garbage food and uh that's yeah and and maltodextrin as a food additive uh it i think it it hasn't been studied, but maltodextrin, I've noticed uh, in, in the research I've done and in dealing with patients and paying very close attention, it maltodextrin is a major factor in, I think, insulin resistance and chronic liver disease and metabolic syndrome. Um, but aspartame, what do you guys think about aspartame? Uh, I don't know, Jones. What do you think about it? I I think it tastes terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, so, I, mean, there, I don't remember if it was aspartame or one of the other artificial sweeteners. There was a couple of studies that came out where they actually found a really similar um, insulin spike from yes. the artificial sweeteners as they do from, from regular sugar, which is bizarre, you know, because no it, one thought that happened, but it's, it's so, like so it's, 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 it's being triggered by your brain thinking you're eating sweet things more so than an actual uh yeah. chemical process you know it, i mean it's actually worse um aspartame is worse and part of the reason is because number one it's a totally foreign substance that does not exist in nature that's the first thing so when you i i, I like to tell people the like the patients who like to think about the grand vastness of reality and what we don't know our genome is thought to be hundreds of thousands of years old or or thousands of years old whatever you want to believe but you take how big our genome has been exposed to natural things, and then you take the size, like the relative proportion of time that aspartame has been has been in, in existence. We don't know how to how to metabolize it, but what aspartame really does, it gets cleaved into methanol, uh, phenylalanine, and aspartic acid, and and in high amounts, those are neurotoxic. The molecule agonizes NMDA receptors and kills neurons, and it causes uh, neuropathy. And, and and aspartame was approved in 1981, went into liquid beverages in 1984, I think. In 1985, there was a subtle 5% increase and a plateau after of brain tumors. And the U.S. does not have the best studies on that. The best studies on aspartame and brain tumors were done overseas. But um, the aspartame industry is horrific and the patients i have that get off of it it takes them at least two weeks to detox um i did podcasts on that and i knew the, the world expert on aspartame who passed away this year but um one thing i was going to talk about there's a there's a radio show i've been a fan of it's called the veritas radio show have have uh, you guys heard of that one it's based in arizona i've heard of it but i haven't uh, i haven't listened yeah, different listen. from James O'Keefe's Project Veritas. This is Veritas Radio, different things. Okay. And James O'Keefe isn't part of Project Veritas. I was thinking of Project Veritas, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and but well, well now James O'Keefe is OMG O'Keefe Media Group. But so uh this uh, radio show they they interviewed a doctor. I think she's a family doctor. Her name's Catherine Shanahan, I think. And she talked about the pillars of the best diet that you could possibly eat. She said uh, fresh, uh, sprouted and fermented. That's, that's its own p pillar. And then meat on the bone and organ meats. So if you have those, those four major groups or, or five, really, if something doesn't fall into those categories, then don't eat it. And I, that's why I think the, like the, like that framework, that mindset is a better way to give people a diet than to just restrict them to X, Y, Z. 
Uh, sure. You give them a mindset, you give them a framework so that they can be creative off of that. But, but it requires education. Like they got to, they got to relearn everything that they've learned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They have to take that stupid food pyramid and tip it upside down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 You're right. But that's a, that's a, I like that. That's a beautiful, uh, I like those pillars. It's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean like grains that, that are not sprouted, you know, they're not lost to us, but if you, if you sprout your grains, then they're way less toxic to you. That's like that, like right there is a perfect example. So, um, before now, like, how much more time do you guys have? I mean, I like, I don't like long winded podcasts, but I, I'm loving this conversation. Do you want to keep going and talk a little bit about music, gents? Uh, I mean, I'm sure we can talk a little bit about it. I'm, yeah. uh, there's one thing I wanted to say before we move on about, yeah, I think you mentioned this idea of, uh, well, you're talking about IBS, right? Irritable bowel syndrome. And I think, yeah, Dan said, you know, some, or someone mentioned, uh, you know, we have this label and you get a, you get a diagnostic code, right? I wanted to mention briefly this uh, word that we've, that we use called um, idiopathic. <laughs> yes. Uh, have you heard this thing, uh, right? There's like the idiopathic fill in the blank, right? We have all kinds of different things, you know, yeah. this idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, right? Mm hmm and with the way that we, the way that it's used is, um, and I think that the way, uh, the way that patients perceive it is they come in to see the doctor and instead of the doctor being honest and saying, I don't know what's wrong with your lungs, you know, you've got fibrosis, they're fibrotic, but I don't know why. <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of that, we say, oh, we know what this is. This is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, right? We, it's a, you can look it up in one of your lung textbooks, like there's papers on it, there's drugs to treat it. You know what I mean? It's like, it makes it really feel like it's something we understand. What the, mm -hmm. what the word literally means, idios is the, is the Greek root, right? It means mm -hmm. a disease that causes itself. Right? Whoa. That's what path it means. So Adios is self causing, pathos is disease, right? So it's a self causing disease. So we, instead of saying this is a disease that we don't know, like such as we could use a word like cryptogenic pulmonary fibrosis, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Think of some other Greek or Latin root. Instead of that, we, we were so uncomfortable with not knowing what caused something, is we invented a word that says, oh, this disease just caused itself. <laughs> it's not that we don't know what caused it or haven't discovered it yet. It's a self-causing disease, right? It's a disease that just does its thing by itself. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, to, me, it's, to me, it says a lot about our whole mindset as physicians in this country is that we're, we're so uncomfortable with the unknown that we, we, we made up a, a whole category of diseases which are functionally idiopathic diseases are diseases that we don't know what they're from, right? We don't understand them. Wow. Uh, but we made up a word. The word that we use for this is it's caused itself, right? Um, there's there's a, there's a positive side to the Latin. Do you guys remember what uh, the word doctor comes from? The Latin for, uh, root of that? Dictum? Teacher? Docea, to teach. Yep. We're supposed to be teachers, Doc. We are supposed to be teaching right. our patients. And that and, and that's what you guys are doing. You guys are practicing the art and, and you're always learning more and, and and you're trying to get your patients to learn more. But there's unfortunately, and I'm gonna put shame on all you doctors out there watching this right now. <laughs> if you doctors are not teaching your patients how to be better, you're failing. And go ahead and comment if you didn't like what I said. I want to see your. Uh, I want to see the tears coming out of your keyboard. Okay. So, um, uh, Jens, like, so music. I've seen that. Uh, that I, I I think it was at UNM or maybe it was at UMC in Tucson. But was there a person with a harp? At yeah. UNM? Yeah. Okay. They, they to, the har a harpist used to come and play in the ICU. Uh huh. I haven't seen them there in a while, and I've, you know, so, and this, you know, this isn't a topic. I, I'm more familiar with music as a musician. I play in various bands and oh. write my own music. 
Awesome. Uh, um, but uh, in, you know, getting ready for this podcast, I just did a little literature searching on it. There's all kinds of studies on music therapy and critically ill patients. Uh-huh. Um, there's a, in fact, there's a meta analysis. They're mostly from Taiwan and China. It looked like not all, but maybe seventy five percent. Um, mostly using kind of classical type music, but they they look at things like anxiety scores, you know, from uh, surveys, biometric data such as vital signs, recovery times after surgeries. Whoa, there's a robust literature on music therapy in in ICUs in pre, uh, pre you know for. Uh, Pre-cert, like pre-anesthesia, you know, patient kind of getting patients calm before they get anesthetized and go under the knife. Post-surgical recovery, uh, burn units. There's a lot of studies on burn patients looking at pain if they like let them listen to music. There's all kinds of cool stuff. One of the things that I noticed reading these various papers um, is sort of a. It's almost like a little depressing. Like a lot of these uh, papers that I read in the con- in the discussion conclusion section, they're like, well. The data is awesome. It works great. There's no side effects to playing some people some chill music, but okay. nobody does it. Like the, it's not a thing, you know. Like I saw a harpist in our ICU once, you know, in 15 years. Um, I shouldn't say nobody, but in general, this is not a standard thing that we do, right? And I think it gets back to the basic idea of, you know, the sort of what are what what is the healthcare system for right is it to help people heal or is it to or is it just a giant industry you know what i mean yeah. and if it's a giant industry i don't think you really want people to get better with interventions that are cheap and easy and pleasant <laughs> you know you want to you want to kind of drag stuff on as long as possible and you know i i like the metaphor of uh of animals you know so we're humans and we're having and we're supposed to be having a human experience but kind of like the paper that you presented on um on uh, one of the hospitalist grand rounds jens i remember you presented this paper and i kept the handout that you gave me i still have it in a box over here okay the ideal census for hospitalists is around 15 or 16 and after 16 the amount of medical errors starts to go up almost exponentially and so for hospitalist programs that are allowing hospitalists to see over 20 patients 23 25 and not simple hips and knees, but sick people, um, the amount of medical errors goes up. So, and, and the same happens in outpatient settings where you have a hospital board and it's basically mostly non-medical people that are making business decisions about something that is sacred. Um, you're basically treating the workers like dogs and then the patients are basically cattle. So you have dogs herding cattle. And that's our healthcare system. That is, that that is. Um, I'd like to make that a patch and call it healthcare, and put like dogs and cattle on it or something. <laughs> good. Yeah. That's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, but um, but Jen's. Uh, so so so, what bands are you a part of, and do you have a website, and do you? Oh have you sure. Released albums or anything? My uh, well, actually, just sitting right here is a album me and my brother just finished. Um, these Rain. are his songs. He calls it Rain, R A E N. Okay. Um, Burning Suns. Um, Urban. This is Burning Suns. Burning Suns. Okay. R A E N. Yeah, this is on, on it's on Spotify. Um, okay. And we may actually print out some records, which has been fun. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just finishing up an album of my own music um, under a, a project called. Uh, Storms in the Hill Country with some buddies from Austin. Cool. Um, I've released one album so far, and I'm or just finishing up another one. Wow. Um, and then I play, I play, I play in three or four cover bands in Albuquerque, just playing bass and guitar and drums, um, with different groups of people. Uh, one of them's more like kind of sixties, seventies classic rock, you know, Sabbath, Cream, Stones, Ooh, nice, Zeppelin, Hendrix kind of stuff. Um, another was a little more kind of country, old, like old school country uh, blues rock kind of stuff. Anyway, you know, it's just it's my my hobby. Do you do you tune your uh, instruments to four thirty two hertz? Oh, cool 
No, I should though. <laughs> I, I, you know, you know, you know who did that of the people you named, Jimi Hendrix. He he apparently tuned his guitar to four thirty two hertz, and and it had a very special effect. If you yeah. if you if you adhere to that to that framework of four thirty two, you will act. Your music has the potential to heal people in theory. So um, <laughs> it's definitely I'll and there's a lot of there's a lot of research on on those harmonics and it's related to the chakras and stuff. So that's a that's amazing. Yeah, I I remember you were musical, but I never never knew all the. Yeah, I was sitting in a um, what, what, what is it? sitting in a tractor on the the band photo. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, just a little snippet. But every but we'll have the link underneath. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna put all the links to like whatever you guys want in in the description. Can can I have the name of the book? Because like I I was trying to search that that book and it's hard to find. So is it called? Oh, this is, I think it's a compilation of abstracts from a research symposium i'm not sure this is a book you're going to find anywhere oh it's not um, a book oh. so what's so what's it called it's called bio bio it a book, but it's, it's not just that yes okay yeah i'm sorry this isn't an abstract book this is it has a it's a compilation of papers let's see if you can read that biomedical biochemical and okay can you find aspects the... of coq10 uh, this is our podcast prop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's great. But, uh, I mean, I'm going to try to find tell them about the habit. <laughs> what if we have time? <laughs> there's We're a, there's have a Dr. study Joe in there about pigeons. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Dr. Joe will write a book called Cattle and Dogs. Uh, that's going to be a bestseller. Dogs, I'll call it Dogs Herding Cattle. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's a bestseller right there. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and Dr. Peter Langshin, what was the name of this of the cholesterol skeptics? You said it was C B T H I S. T H I N C S. Thanks. C H D H I N C S. Dot org. Yeah. Uh great group of people. Really, really good. T H I N C S. Okay. Yeah, they're cool. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm very interested in those. Now. Now, what do you guys think of AAPS, the American Academy of Physicians and Surgeons? Oh, I love them. I'm a member. Um, I actually am friends with one of the board, like one of the board members, and he's a really busy guy, very interesting guy. And his brother mm -hmm. is a functional medicine doctor who completed A4M training. Um, and I've and I've had the opportunity to speak with 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 him a couple times, but uh, there's just there. I I I think there's a lot of good guys. Uh, I, despite all the doom and gloom that people might feel or think when listening to the first part of this podcast, which is not medical advice, by the way, folks, um, I think there's a lot of good guys working. Uh, and I think more of us yeah, need to right. and, and come up and come up with more solutions, because I, I think there's a lot of solutions here that are very easy to implement. Right. I agree. Um, anything else you guys want to talk about? <laughs> I don't know. We could talk for hours, I guess. It's fun. I, uh, I mean, I loved your, I loved your lecture, Peter. I, I, I loved it. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to watch it a second time. Like, like I told you I wanted to, but, um, I, I do plan on going, going through it again and we will throw that link in the description box. Um, it's, I, and we would, and we would love to have you on again. For sure, it's amazing. It. Yeah, I just watched it yeah. thirty minutes before our pod, and it was great. Like a great crash course, the history of Koki to everything, and it's kind of like a appetizer for this more in depth discussion, I guess. But it's, it's pretty comprehensive. So, congrats on that presentation. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I think it could be better. I may do another one. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it proves some things. But yeah, it was fun. It's, it's really cool. quick. Nature Made has a CoQ10 I've been taking. <clears throat> it's probably not the right one because it's not ubiquinol, I discovered, but it's <laughs> ubiquinone. That's Chinese. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> but I still get the diastolic drop in my BP, like after a month <laughs> of taking that. Maybe well, that's just lifestyle. 
Well, maybe. Uh, you know, it's a mixed <laughs> bag, but yeah, you know, it, as a rule, if anything works, I'm in favor of it. You know, the... well, I don't know if it's that, but after this pod, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna switch. <laughs> Yeah, Dan, we're gonna have to do some research and make a list of the and of the vetted companies. We'll say that's nature made right there. The most one of the most trusted brands. (laughs) (laughs) Not sponsored by the Ducker Joe Show. Uh, (laughs) Nope, nope, nope. Nobody sponsoring this at all. And and that's and that's what what I love. I always like to get a Zevia can. Hey, this is not brought to you by Zevia, even though I asked them to sponsor us. Yeah, we we love them though. Yeah, that's yeah, stevia and um, and monk fruit. Those are the two alternative sweeteners that that we always bring up with folks because su- because sucralose is toxic too. It causes liver disease, promotes tumor growth, and yeah. Anyway, but gosh, well, um, I guess I guess that's a wrap, folks, huh? Unless there's something else you guys wanted to wanted to talk about. I I, I this is a privilege and an honor for me. I, I, I hope you guys had fun. Oh, definitely. It's been great. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks so yeah. much for having us. Yeah, let's do it again. It's a fun <laughs> chat. Great.